You think you know him. Wow, I haven't heard a crowd reaction like that since Friday night when L.A. Knight made his return. Uh, let me tell you something. That, that was awesome. That was awesome and uh, very, very cool to see it official that Adam Copeland, uh, also known as Edge, is uh, officially a part of the AEW roster. Um, you know, Wrestle Dream yesterday, I, I have seen bits and pieces of it so far, but I definitely saw Edge's return. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Um, you know, somebody was uh, exchanging a little conversation with me earlier today. And, you know, we were going over some matches that we would like to see in AEW. And sure, maybe some of these opponents he's had before, but under an AEW banner, it would definitely feel different. Um, I'm sure Edge will be able to have a little bit more freedom as far as what he does. But when you think about him versus Kenny Omega, you know, having another match with Brian Danielson, possibly MJF, Adam Cole, Samoa Joe, Andrade, and it just goes down the line. And we didn't even get into tag team matches. We didn't even talk about Christian Cage. Um, listen, anybody that still goes with this idea that Edge sold out, that Edge is a traitor and this, this and that. You know, what's worse about reading dumb shit like that is you have a lot of very intelligent fans out there. You have a lot of intelligent journalists out there. You have a lot of intelligent podcasters out there that know that it is that mindset is some of the dumbest shallow outdated moronic ideas to have and they fucking love every time these people say stupid shit like that because it allows them to profess the obvious the common sense and you just you got to ignore the dumb shit he's in aew he's needed Obviously, AEW has been stuck in the mud. You look at the ratings, you look at ticket sales outside of Wembley, you look at house shows. You know, that was awesome. There was nothing negative about that yesterday. And the fact that everything that we talked about and had a hunch about ended up being true makes it even more, you know, uh, sensible. 
You know, we talked about it the last couple of weeks. You know, Edge has done everything he possibly can in WWE. And sure, there's you could come up with a match here and a match there. But I brought it up over the weekend. You know, unless you are part of this current, you know, programming, the, the storylines that WWE has between the bloodline and the judgment day, they are riding that. They are treading that. There is really nothing for Edge to slide into and have a three-month, six-month, possibly one-year full-time run. You know, when I brought up that someone who I trust that works with an AEW telling me that Tony Khan offered lucrative money to Adam Copeland, you know, this is very similar to others who have left WWE. We talked about it a week ago. He went to WWE. Edge, Adam Copeland, did not want to leave the WWE family. The thing is, he's done everything pretty much he possibly can. And when AEW made their offer, WWE did not want to match that offer and gave him the best wishes to go. Plus, I saw a lot of people like, wow, I can't believe he's able to use his music and this and that. This is not the Vince McMahon owned WWE anymore. This is TKO Group Holdings. You know, they're not going to look at little tiny details, you know, and they be a little bit more relaxed about it. Plus, why would TKO even bother to spend all that additional coin to prevent this guy, you know, because he's got an entrance? You think TKO Group Holdings feels that AEW is a strong threat. If that was the case, TKO Group Holdings could offer crazy money every time somebody at AEW becomes a free agent. The fact of the matter is Adam Copeland is rejuvenated. He is going to work full time. You know, I had a few people uh, having some fun with me earlier saying like, oh, DT, the money is not that big of a factor. He saved his money. He's a millionaire. Listen, in this day and age, you know, you think that Edge has a nest egg that has his daughter set for life, his kids set for life, and their kids set for life. There's never enough money in this world. And AEW is not only paying him big, but they're also going to utilize him the way that he wants to finish up his career. Sure, for the lifelong WWE fans and who, those who are older, who have enjoyed Edge over the last 25 years, you know, you want to have that idea that he's a lifer, you know, that he'll retire in WWE. This is not your old WWE anymore. You know, we just had this conversation over the weekend that, you know, wrestlers are going to look at WWE more of TKO Group Holdings, an outside company owning it now. You have some emotional ties because of the history and the longevity and the relationship you've made with people, but this is a business. And at the end of the day, AEW offered him a much better deal, big money, freedom, the ability to have more matches, and that's it. How people have to make this into a complicated talking point is asinine. It's cool to see. And, guys, we got to see the hug. There's the hug. There's the hug. Very, very mild. Very cool. Very cool. Listen, I know there's a lot that you could criticize about AEW and Tony Khan. But there's a lot that you could criticize about WWE and Vince McMahon over the years as well. You know, we're going to see uh, him continue his career and him reunite with Christian whether as friend or as foe, and it's good TV. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Very, very cool. So we're not going to talk that much further as far as Adam Copeland because on Monday nights we dedicate it mostly to WWE. Wednesdays is dedicated primarily to AEW and NXT. But I will let you know if you are interested, this Wednesday, October 4th, uh, he will you know, be talking. And once again, you know, I, I understand that you all can't tune into every minute of every hour of everything that I discuss. But for those asking me, how could he use the rated R superstar uh, trademark? WWE, I, I brought this up twice already. WWE abandoned that three years ago. 
He is allowed to be the rated R superstar. I'll go one step further. Uh, Adam Copeland filed for a trademark legend, but he is not spelling legend L-E-G-E-N-D. He is spelling it L-E-D-G-E-N-D. Get it? Legend with edge in the middle. It's not to fuck with WWE. It's a little creative way of doing things. This is cool. This is fun. You know, back in the 90s, you know, when you saw Raw and Nitro feuding, and you get this person pops up on Nitro, and this person pops up on Raw, and these people leave, and the radicals leave, and this person shows up. You know, we have not enjoyed that very much in the last 15 years. Because NWA TNA, later TNA, later Impact Wrestling, never was really a viable threat to WWE. When wrestlers are allowed to work indies as well, it doesn't feel that you're taking someone from the competition. You know, and once again this weekend, it just once again proves what we've talked about. You know, so many examples. And we talked about it last week. The wrestling community, the wrestlers, everybody in the business has nothing but love and best wishes for Adam Copeland. But the wrestling community, the IWC, not everybody, a very, very small portion, but that small portion is the most outspoken. And to see people with half a brain wasting their time on these brain-dead fools that just want to start shit. They did it with Jay Cargill. They're doing it again with Adam Copeland. And you know what? The pro wrestling world looks at these people and they think that they're just goofs, jokes. I wish I could use stronger words, but, you know, it's 2023. We got to be a little bit more politically correct. Uh, tonight, we talked about it, I think, yesterday. Yesterday on the sit-down, someone asked me, hey, when are we going to have Johnny Gargano return? And if you tune into yesterday's show, we talked about it. Once Ciampa gets the title match against Gunther, just to have an opponent for Gunther, you will see Johnny Gargano return. Now, I'm not going to lie. We did not expect it all to happen tonight. Some people are kind of annoyed. Why did we get Gunther versus Tommaso Ciampa tonight? No fast lane? Not even a week's hype contract signing and the match happens tonight as well? Well, a couple of reasons. And I actually look, tried to get answers for this. The reason why we got Gunther versus Tommaso Ciampa tonight is because WWE decided... We were originally... Listen... When we get into match results tonight, there was three matches that were supposed to go down that did not go down. The one match, most importantly, is Jey Uso versus Damian Priest. That was supposed to be the main event for Raw tonight. But as we've been noticing with the ratings, the ratings have been terrible for these main events. I'm not saying Gunther versus Ciampa is going to blow up you know, pop a good rating. I mean, we've talked about it. Chomp has been, sorry to say it, some of the lowest quarters in Raw in recent months. So why would you put Gunther versus Chomp at a main event when it's hour three, opposed Monday Night Football, when Chomp doesn't really pop great of a rating and when and Monday night's third hour is not all that great, especially towards main event time? Well, that's part of the reason. WWE decided to hold off on any physicality as far as a match goes leading into Fastlane. They announced a new title match at Fastlane tonight. The match that we kind of feared last week, they would announce and they did announce it. It's going to be Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso taking on Finn Balor and Damian Priest at Fastlane for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. I wish they would start having them defend these titles on each brand. You know, I know they don't really call them the Raw and the SmackDown tag team titles anymore, 
but technically that's what they are. You know, undisputed WWE Tag Team Champions is because they have both sets of titles. It's undisputed. They have both, but they still walk around with a red belt and a blue belt. I mean, it's about time that the, the red belt is defended on Raw and the blue belt is defended on SmackDown. You got the Street Profits that, you know, what are you going to do? Wait until it starts fizzling out again? So the fact that they're fighting for both championships, it's the same mindset that I had over the weekend with Wrestle Dream with Eddie Kingston. And yes, Eddie Kingston with the ROH and the IWGP championships is a, is much smaller scale compared to the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. But when they announced Eddie Kingston was going to defend both titles at Wrestle Dream, there was no way he was going to lose both belts. They just made this big inspirational story on how he, you know, fought and clawed for 20 years and got to this point. You don't do that magical moment and make it feel that emotional and then two weeks later take it off of them. If they would have put only one title on the line, people would have had the suspension of disbelief. You know what? He could possibly drop the title, but at least he's still Ring of Honor heavyweight champion. At least he's still IWGP champion. When you have two titles... And you only defend one, it makes people believe that, hey, you, they may actually lose that singular title, because, but they still have another championship. So that's what we got tonight. So they just did, decided against having Jey Uso and Damian Priest close out Raw. They decided to hold off until Fastlane. And they are having Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso on SmackDown this Friday. How they close out. SmackDown, as far as their involvement goes, because they might close out with John Cena and LA Knight, obviously. But don't be surprised if you see a little extra interaction with Cody Rhodes as well, because Cody will be on SmackDown. Jey Uso will be on SmackDown. Roman Reigns will not. Not this week. Next week, Roman Reigns will be on. And that's when shit starts getting interesting because now we go into the fall and you go to Survivor Series. Of course, we got Saudi Arabia and you have some other, you know, events as well. But before you know it, they got to start name dropping, teasing Cody versus Roman once again. And it's going to happen a lot sooner than you realize. And don't forget, somebody ends up, is going to ultimately be drafted to SmackDown since Jey Uso was drafted to Raw, and that person will be Cody Rhodes. So we will see what happens. But I got ratings from this past week. I'll share it with you. This week's ratings, very, very interesting. I don't want to give it away, but there are two, more than two individuals, but two times this week. And I don't remember the last time this has ever happened. We had two times this week where individuals were the highest point of Raw and SmackDown, and they were also the lowest point of Raw and SmackDown. I kid you not, when we get into ratings, you will see it. But as we said earlier, Johnny Gargano is back. Gunther fought Tommaso Ciampa tonight as the main event. Great fight, maybe not on the level as NXT stand and deliver from a few months, a few years ago, but still, it, they gave them about 20 minutes. Gunther could fight a shadow and put on a four star match. This match was great, but after the match was over, after Gunther choked out Ciampa, you know, put him in a sleeper, Gunther walks off and you get Imperium in the ring beating down Tommaso Ciampa. Now, I know most people online thought that Alpha Academy was going to come out to make the save, but we did not get that. Johnny Gargano's music hits instead. Johnny Gargano ends up taking out both members of Imperium, and that now will start a little bit of a feud between DIY and Imperium. And this was also fact in Alpha Academy, because Alpha Academy, listen, Chad Gable is not, in the IC title hunt anymore right now as much as you think he is. They will keep it lingering because people are rooting for him. But this will also put a little distraction because now you'll see Vinci. And listen, uh, Vinci by now should have been booted out of Imperium. 
but they have decided to keep him around a little bit longer. So Kaiser has a tag team partner to wrestle other teams. And now you have DIY in the mix. That is a good move. And who knows? Could DIY end up with tag team gold in the next few months? It is possible. It is possible. But uh, this Raw was heavily rewritten. Some of it by creative decision. Some of it due to injury. I won't show the graphic, but uh, Becky Lynch, as we discussed yesterday, needed 11 stitches to close up the gash in her arm. And as a result, WWE decided there was no way that she was going to defend the NXT Women's Championship tonight against Tegan Knox. That will happen next week. But Becky Lynch will be on NXT tomorrow night. Now, remember, tomorrow is the beginning of the NXT breakout tournament on the women's side. And I have the brackets. I have the list of participants. And I took a couple of photos and put a nice little photo collage together so you could see every woman that's in this tournament. And I tell you, you know, I'm not trying to be superficial right now, but WWE's got some massive hotties in NXT. Holy shit. In fact, honestly, I don't care if you're straight, you know, whatever you, whether you like the M&M's plain or with peanut, or maybe you like both with that, whatever floats your boat is cool with me, but you have to admire beauty. And believe me when I tell you, these women know that they are beautiful. That's why they dress in beautiful outfits and show off their assets. So before we get into Raw and before we discuss a little bit more, for those that are interested, this is the participants for the uh, NXT Women's Breakout Tournament. And I gathered these photos so you could get an idea as far as, you know, who's in this. We got Ariana Grace, who is Santino Medella's daughter. Santina Marella. So she is in a tournament. She was just in a beauty pageant as well. She didn't win, but she's playing with that gimmick. Danny Palmer is also in this tournament. I had to do a little bit of a sunset background just to make it look a little bit better. Izzy Dame is also in this tournament. That's a name that probably a lot of you do not know yet. You will. You will in the very near future. Uh, Jada Parker is in this tournament. I don't know why people are trying to play off that because her name is Jada, that they're throwing in Jay Cargill's name with this. It's two totally different names, but she is in this tournament. Uh, we have three other people in this tournament. Jakara Jackson, who is part of Metaphor, she is in this tournament. And then we have uh, Carmen Petrovic. That's another name. You know, a lot of people think like she looks a little bit like Penelope Ford, but uh, she's got a nice little gimmick about her. But for me, I think the the favorite to win this, and it's oh, actually no, we got two more. Kalani Jordan is in this tournament. Kalani Jordan was supposed to feud with Dana Brooke, but they released Dana Brooke, so she is out of it. But we also have Lola Vice. Wait a minute, how do I have? Oh yeah, I have eight people. I had the NXT banner at the beginning, so I thought I had nine listed. But I think Lola Vice, Valerie Lareda, I think she is the odds-on favorite to win this. So that those are your participants. These are your brackets for those that are interested. The tournament starts on Tuesday. And uh, I, think Lola, I think it's going to come down to Lola Vice and possibly Kalani Jordan. I think Lola Vice is going to get it. So... We will see what happens. That is tomorrow in NXT. Also tomorrow in NXT, Dominic Mysterio gets a rematch against Trick Williams. And the storyline with the Judgment Day and Dominic Mysterio has suddenly gotten very, very interesting. Because tonight, Mommy, Mommy made an ultimatum to Dominic Mysterio. Come home with that championship or don't come home at all and she gave him an ultimatum and we had a nice little cameo tonight from trick williams trick williams was introduced to raw got a nice little reaction from the fans i mean not a tremendous buy I, I would have thought people would have popped big just for the fact that he took the title off of dominic mysterio but the crowd gave him a nice little reaction 
And he is going to have a rematch tomorrow against Dominic Mysterio. And he ultimately was confronted by J.D. McDonough, Dominic Mysterio, and Rhea Ripley. And Rhea Ripley tells Trick Williams that tomorrow Dom is going to regain that championship. And Dominic will not be alone. So either Rhea Ripley will be there or J.D. McDonough will be there. Now, if you watched Raw tonight, Just pretend this in two scenarios here. Dominic loses in a rematch tomorrow. Whether it's JD's fault, not JD the podcaster, my friend of mine, um, but JD McDonough or Rhea Ripley shows up. I personally think that Rhea Ripley should show up. And I think somebody should neutralize Rhea Ripley. And the reason why I say that is because if Dominic Mysterio loses his rematch tomorrow and it's his own fault or J.D. McDonough fucks up, how do you continue that storyline on Raw or keep it consistent where J.D. McDonough is trying to get in Judgment Day and he's doing things to help? Last week, it was J.D. McDonough that nailed Sami Zayn, which allowed Damian Priest to get the win. That's... Big brownie points for J.D. McDonough to get in Judgment Day. If J.D. McDonough backfires tomorrow and Trick Williams retains, you know, what does that say about J.D. McDonough? So me personally, if you put Rhea Ripley there and Rhea Ripley, somebody shows up. I don't, I don't want to say it's Becky Lynch, but if someone shows up, Lyra Valkyrie, anybody, and gets into it with Rhea or neutralizes Rhea and Dominic loses, Rhea's not going to get mad at herself. Rhea kind of fucked up. So that scenario seems the most logical. And the other scenario is Trick Williams only has that belt for 48 hours. Do they dare take that title off of Trick Williams in 48 hours? Would you really revisit Dominic Mysterio as North American champion again? I'll be honest with you. Unless they're bringing Dragon Lee to that main roster, Dragon Lee has earned a run with the NXT North American Championship. So it's going to be really interesting tomorrow to see how that goes down. So we will wait and see. Now, speaking of tomorrow, for anybody that is interested, by the way, did you see the shirt? Got a, got the shirt today, paying tribute to Terry Funk, um, wearing it with pride. And for some of you that did not see this, in Amarillo, Texas, over the weekend, an artist painted a mural on this, I don't know what building it was, but I know fans have already visited it. That is a mural painted to pay tribute to Terry Funk. I honestly, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, is that the side of the ECW arena? But then I realized it's, yeah, the side of the building doesn't look that nice, but uh, it's a beautiful mural. And, uh, you know, Terry Funk, without saying, look, my favorite wrestler of all time. So it was pretty cool timing to get the shirt delivered today and see the mural, deli you know, put up today, you know, as well. That was pretty cool, them doing that over the weekend. But if you are interested, tomorrow night, right after NXT, Kevin and I will be recording your preview and predictions for WWE Fastlane. We will be live on Patreon, patreon.com slash Don Tony. If you're not part of our Patreon family, no worries. It'll be on DonTony.com Wednesday for everybody. But if you want to join us live and be part of the conversation, we'll be there tomorrow night, 10.05 p.m., right after NXT. And then for our channel members on YouTube and our patrons, this Saturday we have the predictions contest, giving away a couple of 50s, a couple of 50s, fitties, as some people say. and. Uh, congratulations to Big Sal. We did a watch party for SmackDown Friday, and we were giving away, someone was going to win their choice of an autographed Gunther, an autographed LA Knight, or an autographed Dominic Mysterio WWE Panini card. And uh, I told the company that, you know, does, helps me with the watch parties. I said, you pick the winner. Just look, because they could see everybody who showed up during the night. I said, pick somebody random. Just send me the name. And they sent me Big Sal. So Big Sal, congrats to you. You got to DM me on Twitter at Don Tony D or email me. 
Don Tony at DonTony.com. Let me know which card you want. If you go to my Twitter, you could see a picture of all three cards and you choose. Something tells me he's going to take the card that's selling right now for about 170 bucks. So congrats, Sal. We're going to probably do the next watch party this Friday. I was going to do one tomorrow, but with Kevin and I doing fast lane predictions, it's going to be a little bit of an overload to sit my fat ass in his chair for five hours straight. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give my ass a break tomorrow. So Friday on SmackDown, we'll do a little watch party for those that would like to be part of it. And we might do another giveaway. It uh, depends on what the turnout looks like. So, okay. Um, Want to get into a couple other news tidbits. As far as Adam Copeland goes, and I'm just going to keep this very, very brief. Before we get into Raw, and then we'll talk about the ratings in this week in wrestling history. This week in wrestling history, this week is big. Very big. And I got a couple of audio clips. Some of them are fucking doozies. I guarantee there's at least one that you've never heard before. And I will tell, give you a hint. This person is currently in prison. It's currently in prison. Um, before I get into Adam Copeland's statement, as far as leaving WWE and joining AEW, I wanted to share with you something that almost nobody is talking about that I think is so fucking cool. A lot of you know about Sammy Faseria, Sami Zayn raising money to, you know, to help improve Syria. He builds like, you know, I think water, you know, water wells, you know, for clean water. And he does a lot for Syria. Sammy is just beautiful with that. I mean, I, I know a lot of you have donated in the past, as I. And for those that are not aware, you want to see something fucking cool? A week ago, Edge, a lot of people didn't even know this, Edge donated the outfit that he wore in his final WWE match against Sheamus. He ded dedicated, donated the outfit for sammy see the auction is currently live all the proceeds will benefit sam's and sammy for syria it is autographed it is dated it is his full outfit and that is beautiful this is what he said he says i'm posting these pictures of my toronto maple leafs theme ring gear for my 25th anniversary show a couple of weeks ago for a reason we're going to auction them off with 100% of the proceeds going for to SammyFaseria.com, headed up by my colleague Sammy Zane to provide free medical care to displaced citizens with their mobile medical clinics, which travel from camp to camp in northwest Syria. I have never sold or auctioned any of my gear before. I have it all from my first match to now. So if you'd like to help a great cause and end up with an interesting conversation piece, keep your eyes peeled, check out WWE Auctions, and myself will let you know when it's up for grabs. And it is up for grabs right now. That's pretty amazing. He has never, ever sold or auctioned off any gear. Nothing. Nothing. Not even boots. That's pretty amazing. And that is very, very generous for adam copeland to do i know we're gonna say edge you know it, listen i want to make something clear um even when x pac was in impact uh, you know people would still call him x pac or they call him Pac, whatever it is you know sometimes you call him sean Waltman or whatever you know and some wrestlers are always known by if you call him edge don't be like these fools out there. His name is not Edge anymore. His name is Adam Copeland, damn it. Do not call him Edge. He is no longer Edge. Shut up. Seriously, you call him whatever you want to call him. Yeah, his real name, Adam Copeland, I get it. But if you want to call him Edge for a nickname, listen, how many of you call CM Punk Phil Brooks? Honestly, I know for a fact that, you know, unless you know him personally, He'll call you a douchebag for calling him by his real name. A lot of wrestlers, unless you know them on a personal level, you call them by their wrestling name, what everybody knows them for. You know, listen, I've, I've told this story before. 
I'm going to share with now because I think it's a good example of it right now. Back in the mid 2000s, um, when Impact Wrestling was in Orlando, when they were still TNA, um, when they would be in Universal Studios trying to get people to go into the building and, you know, get a little air condition and take in a little bit of wrestling, you know, so they could fill up the building. Somebody, I don't know if it was Jeremy Borash, but somebody would have a megaphone in Universal Studios and go on the microphone, come see the New Age Outlaws today at Building Whatever. They weren't the New Age Outlaws in in TNA, but they used the most recognizable name to get, oh, the New Age Outlaws, yeah, the Road Dog, suck it, suck it. Yeah, we're going back to mid-2000s. Companies have done that. Companies have done that. This, this, and listen, he it's so new, so you call him whatever you want to call him. But anyway, enough of that. Let's briefly get into Adam Copeland's statement. For those that did not read it, I will read it to you very quickly. This is what he had to say. As some of you may know now, I am no longer with WWE. My new home is AEW. I'm excited. Whole new roster. Some familiar faces that I wanted to work with again, and a whole set of first ever matches, new challenges. And if you followed my career, you know that's what I've always been driven by. He continues. But first and foremost, I want to address my 25 years with WWE. I love WWE and appreciate everything the company did for me. Always have, always will. They put me on the map, gave me amazing opportunities, and through hard work on both ends, I've been supplied with a wonderful life. Hell, WWE helped me meet the woman I'd start my family with. Sometimes relationships just grow apart, and I feel that WWE and I had just outgrown each other. I wanted to do more. They did not have much for me to do. Simple as that, and that's okay. I'll still be watching and still be supporting all of my friends there. He continues, I don't buy into this odd mentality of one company or the other. It's weird. If you took offense to that, take a walk, get some fresh air, and soak up some sunshine. It's wrestling. It's an amazing gig, but still, it's wrestling. Relax. It's supposed to be fun. And it's just a segment for the, of the fans, not most fans, and definitely not the performers. Within the industry, we all know that more choices is better for everyone and pushes us all to be better. As a wrestling fan, which I still am, it's exciting that there's viable companies providing wrestling on a national and worldwide platforms. If you're actually a fan of wrestling, and not acronyms, that should make you happy too. And he finishes up by saying, I guess what I'm trying to say is this. If you've appreciated my work, you still can, no matter what the initials are, because I'll still be busting my ass every time I'm out there. This ride isn't over just yet. Just try to have fun like it should be, because trust me, I'll be having fun every time I'm out there in an AEW ring. How do you, how do you fight that? How do you criticize that? You can't, you can't. There's always going to be someone that's going to find a negative in something, but that's just a guy that still loves what he does. Does not have many years left. Would have loved to have done more in WWE, but for the amount of money that Tony Khan, listen, Tony Khan and I, we brought this up, Saturday, when I said that he's he's signing, it's it's a deal. You know, Tony Khan give him fifty million dollars if he wants. It's his money. It's it's my money, and I'll do what I want with it. Isn't that a commercial? But really, Tony Khan could pay whatever he wants. Look at Jade Cargill, for an example. Without getting into real big details, we'll talk about it Wednesday. But in the media scrum after Wrestle Dream. Tony Khan actually opened up a little bit about Jade Cargill. And Tony Khan said, I made her an offer. 
she she came back and said that you know WWE made an offer, and then Tony Khan gave her a bigger offer, more than she were, was originally asking for, and he thought that they were close to a deal. And next thing you know, she left. No ill will, but Jay Cargill. It's not just about the money aspect. It's about building a legacy, a Hall of Fame career, a superstar, superhero, larger than life. One of the most iconic women in wrestling history. And she felt even if both sides were offering similar money, she could get that challenge and opportunity in WWE. When it comes to Adam Copeland, Edge in WWE, when Tony, can we, and this again, I'm repeating what we said over the weekend. When, when Tony Khan made that lucrative offer to Adam Copeland, just like Scott Hall and just like others over the years, some went back to Vince. Now it's TKO Group Holdings and said, look, match it or just come close and I'll stay. But in WWE's eyes, they don't see Edge as a full time competitor anymore. A couple of years ago, they couldn't even figure out that they wanted to do something with Christian. Now, let's be honest. You look at the smoke and mirrors with Christian Cage. Up until this month, I think Christian only had one match over the last year, you know, or two matches tops. Christian Cage did not wrestle much over the last 12 months, but it's you forget about it very, very quickly when the person returns to the ring. But even WWE, they could have had... A little bit of a watered down version of Christian because Christian would not be able to say half the things he says if he was on WWE television. But WWE, they look at it, it's an investment. And they feel that, that Edge in 2023 is not going. Listen, look at Cody Rhodes. Look at Cody Rhodes. And let's be honest Cody Rhodes is the number one ambassador to the WWE, not named John Cena. Cody Rhodes is that guy. Outside the ring, he is that guy. You see, you feel it, you know it everywhere. How he goes out of his way and a little bit extra for everyone, that is him. He is the guy. But as far as television goes, as far as ratings go, Cody Rhodes is not a big ratings draw. You don't see people in droves tuning in because, oh, Cody's on tonight. I got to watch Cody. Within three weeks of Cody Rhodes returning in 2022, the ratings were right back to what they were. And I remember because a lot of people who were very bitter about Cody leaving AEW were rubbing it in people's faces. Oh, look, look, the ratings are even worse now and Cody's back in WWE. So... You know, as far as television goes, you know, Edge is not going to do much. And listen, even the night that he had his final match with Sheamus, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but do you remember when The Rock recently appeared and he had the interaction with Matt, Pat McAfee and Austin Theory? We were looking at other Raws in 2023 that were very similar in the ratings. And we talked about Roman's 1,000-day celebration. We talked about the tribal uh, court of Roman Reigns. We did not talk about Edge's retirement match. That match did not generate a great rating because it's about perception. WWE fans love Edge for the most part. They appreciate Edge. Listen to that crowd reaction yesterday. That's not just AEW fans. Those are Edge fans. Those are wrestling fans that are excited that you know what? He's not done just yet. He's not done just yet. But the thing is, as far as WWE television goes, if you're going to use Edge sparingly, putting him on TV once in a blue moon is great and everything, but you're not going to... My blinds just came tumbling down. I just got scared. Oh, that sucks. Everybody across my... Uh, uh, backyard can see me right now podcasting. I don't know if you could hear that. I can't sh turn the camera, but my blinds just came tumbling down. Fuck, I got to fix my blinds later after the show is over. Oh, that was scary, man. At least we didn't talk about anybody that died. I mean, you. I, we don't need to bring that up, but those two times, man, creepy. But uh, 
Anyway, the bottom line is, you know, perception is a very big deal. And edge was not being used, you know, the way that we, we would invest where you want to tune in every week to see what goes down. We got invested with the bloodline, Sami Zayn, Roman Reigns, uh, Jimmy Uso, Jay Uso, Solo Sokoa. You know, when something was heavily involved in a storyline, people tuned in week in and week out. Shit. It was not that long ago that the Judgment Day were doing much better in the ratings because people were like, wow, the Judgment Day, wow, I think they're even better than the Bloodline stuff. There were people saying that. And then it just got old quickly. And people got sick and tired. The Judgment Day, run, Monday night, whoa. So Edge, it was just, he was there in WWE. In AEW, it's a little different. And listen, I want to say one last thing in closing about Edge tonight, and we'll move on. You look at what happened with CM Punk. Darby Allen, who I'm not the biggest fan of, out of everybody who made a quote yesterday about Adam Copeland's debut, Darby Allen's I got a kick out of the most. You know what Darby Allen said? He said that when he met Adam Copeland, Edge, yesterday before the show, the first thing that Edge said to him was, don't worry. I'm not one of those guys that likes to say, back in my day, you know, like other wrestlers do. And Darby Allen said, wait a minute. Back in your day, you were spearing people through flaming tables. I kind of like what you did back in the day. So Adam Copeland right off the bat is showing that it, it gives you almost those Brian Danielson vibes. It might even give you better vibes than Brian Danielson. The reason why I say that is that Brian Danielson loves wrestling, obviously. Duh. But Brian Danielson, I think for a lot of people, the vibes are is that he goes home. Like, he, he loves wrestling, but he goes home to his family, and that's it. With Adam Copeland, yes, he goes home to a family as well, but Adam Copeland still has this real passionate love for wrestling that, you know, I think he wants to be world champion again. Does anybody out there, you, you remember a year and a half ago, I said, I don't think Brian Danielson will ever be AEW world champion. Might be a ring of honor champion, but he will never be AEW world champion. I don't know why I feel that, but it always feels like at the times where Brian Danielson as world champion would have been the most logical decision to do a year and a half ago at the media scrum. When all that shit was going down, Brian Danielson would have been the perfect Band-Aid beyond a Band-Aid. That would have been stitches, patch, everything. Brian Danielson representing AEW as the world champion on the heels of everything that happened with CM Punk and the media scrum a year and a half ago would have given that impression. And they didn't do that. They, I think they gave it to Moxley instead. And I still feel that Brian Danielson will never be AEW world champion. I don't think he wants to be world champion. Adam Copeland, I get a different vibe, though. I think Adam Copeland wants to be world champion again. Two different people. So, all right. Let's talk a little bit about Raw. Then we'll get into ratings, little history. Uh, the history stuff is great this week. I will show you this. Today, today is the 20 year anniversary. We're not going to do the history segment now, but I want to just share this with you because you, you all love Eddie Guerrero. Today, right now, is the 20 year anniversary of the infamous segment with Eddie Guerrero, the big show, Paul White, and Diarrhea. Basically, if I remember correctly, the segment was, was that Big Show was feuding with Eddie Guerrero. And Big Show decided he was going to spike Eddie Guerrero's tacos, I think, with laxatives. Somehow, Big Show ended up having the laxatives. So he's taking a dump in the bathroom, and Eddie Guerrero hides all the toilet paper, and Big Show's begging him for toilet paper. And he got so upset that he ripped the door off. So that happened 20 years ago today. I don't think we'll play the, the audio, though, because it's pretty disgusting. But uh, all right, we'll get into that a little bit later. Let's briefly talk about Raw. Okay, the first match that was canceled today was Becky Lynch versus Tegan Knox for the NXT Women's Championship. Becky Lynch 
deep gash in her arm. I I tell you, you know what was funny about it? I'm not going to show the injury because it is disgusting. I was blown away that WWE showed it on TV, unedited. Especially for WWE standards. Like, they always put things in black and white. Even if there's a drop of blood, they put it in back, black and white. Today, they showed it. And honestly, if you looked at it on TV, it looked like either somebody like rubbed like lipstick on somebody's arm. Some other perverted people out there thought it looked like a deformed pussy. You know, whatever you wanted to say, it looked like some people thought it looked like a piece of raw chicken. But uh, you go on social media and fucking websites are pixelating it. Ask backwards. WWE puts it out there and everybody else pixelates it. So this match did not go down tonight. It will happen next week. But we had something weird happen today with Natalia. If anybody saw Raw, you probably got the same vibe that I did about Natalia. Um, yeah, some behavioral issues there. We'll get into that a little bit. So that was one match that did not go down today. Another match that did not go down today was Nia Jax versus Shayna Baszler. Instead of this match opening up Raw, we see them brawling in the back. Nia Jax ends up in the middle of the ring. And then, coincidentally, some of the women that she injured over the past bunch of weeks decide they all get a return at the same time. Raquel Rodriguez comes out there. She starts brawling with Nia Jax. Rhea Ripley comes out there. She starts brawling with Nia Jax. And the crowd popped big for Rhea Ripley. And even when Rhea Ripley got on the mic and she says to everyone, Mommy is back, she got big time pop. Rhea Ripley at the beginning of the show was over as a big time baby face in a matter of 10 minutes though. She's telling the crowd, shut up and boot out of the building. It's very cool and interesting to see how the crowd reacts to Rhea Ripley because if storyline, if Rhea allows them, they will cheer her big time. And if she wants, she could get them to boo the shit out of her. And we open up the show with a little bit of a distraction. Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler does not happen. Starts as a brawl in the back, ends up Nia in the ring. She gets uh, a little bit of uh, karma from Raquel Rodriguez and Rhea Ripley. Match next week will be Raquel Rodriguez versus Nia Jax. Nia gets out of Dodge eventually, and Rhea Ripley's in the ring. And she's got some business she needs to address, some Judgment Day business. So she calls out the Judgment Day. Finn Balor is not there. Finn Balor is not cleared to compete tonight. They gave him time off. Damian Priest was there, who was not cleared tonight. They gave him the night off. Dominic Mysterio was there as well. So Dominic hits the ring. Damian Priest hits the ring. Rhea Ripley was gone for a couple of weeks because of the injury. And, you know, she starts reading the riot act. She starts reading the riot act to Damien Priest. You know, she says there are no leaders in Judgment Day, but she expected Damien Priest to basically, I don't want to say hold the fort, but she started reading the riot act to Damien Priest. So Damien Priest he gets on the mic and he's like, you know what? Screw Cody. Actually, Rhea, another thing Rhea Ripley did say was that people on Raw are starting to not be intimidated by Judgment Day, that they're starting to end. Obviously, Damian Priest takes it out on Cody Rhodes, criticizes Cody Rhodes. He's a little sick and tired of Cody Rhodes. Screw Cody Rhodes. Screw main event Jey Uso. Now it's a little seeds to plant the match at Fastlane. So when Damian Priest said, screw Cody Rhodes, screw Jey Uso, and screw all the talk about the Judgment Day falling apart. And then Damian Priest looks at Dominic Mysterio. And then he looks at Rhea Ripley. He's like, look, I'm not trying to start something, but mommy, where's Dom's title? And then the crowd starts chanting, where's your title? Where's your title? So Rhea Ripley 
then reveals that Dom Dom has a rematch on Tuesday. And that's where I showed you earlier that she gets in the face of Dominic Mysterio. And she says, if you don't come home with that title, then don't bother coming home at all. So before the crowd could really get into that, Jey Uso's music hits. Jey Uso hits the ring. And this was interesting because I think the fans got a little bit confused about it. Jey Uso says it's happy to, he's happy to see Rhea Ripley is back on Raw. He says that we all missed Rhea Ripley. But then he says there's a new tribal chief on Raw. And he's talking about Rhea Ripley. And then he says that Rhea has bigger balls than Roman Reigns. Now, if you go back and you listen to the crowd reaction, I think the crowd was confused. Was he complimenting Rhea Ripley that she's got a bigger set? You know, she's got more balls than Roman Reigns? Or was Jey Uso questioning her womanhood? If you go back and you listen to the reaction, the reaction was a little bit confused. I think people were confused. Like, is he complimenting her or is he insulting her? So Damian Priest then grabs the mic and Damian Priest is like, you know what? I'm tired of hearing Jey Uso on Raw. Dominic grabs the mic and they ampli amplify the crowd booze. So you can't even hear Dom. And, and it honestly looked like Dom was going to laugh. At this time, it really looked like Dom was going to laugh. But Dominic looks at Damian Priest and says, since you're not medically cleared, I will take care of Jay tonight. He tries to cheap shot Jay Uso. Jay Uso gets the best of Dom for a brief moment. J.D. McDonough shows up. J.D. McDonough starts beating down Jay Uso with Dom. And then Cody Rhodes finally shows up. And then Adam Pierce out of nowhere, Adam Pierce announces that at Fastlane, it's going to be Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso versus uh, Damian Priest and Finn Balor for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. Take note, no Sami Zayn, no Kevin Owens. You know, that kind of was an afterthought tonight. I guarantee there was a lot of people that didn't even think about, you know, their involvement tonight. So... That's how we opened up Raw. So now by this time, we're already about 20 minutes in. And technically, we didn't even have a match yet. So we don't get Becky Lynch and Tegan Knox. We don't get Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. And we don't get Damian Priest and Jey Uso. Instead, what we get to open up Raw, and there, there's Cody Rhodes who made the save for Jey Uso. But we open up Raw, and we got Otis... And Chad Gable, Alpha Academy, losing to Imperium. Otis, it's like rinse and repeat when they take on Alpha Academy as team or as singles. Otis hits the Caterpillar, Ludwig Kaiser. He picks up Ludwig Kaiser. He's standing on the middle rope. He's about to drop Ludwig Kaiser, give him a little suplex. But Giovanni Vinci grabs Otis's leg, Otis. So Kaiser lands on Otis. Next thing you know, Chad Gable dives outside the ring, takes out Giovanni Vinci, and with Otis a little bit distracted, Ludwig Kaiser hits the Inziguri and pins Otis. One, two, three. So Imperium wins, and the storyline is that Vinci and Kaiser proved themselves a little bit tonight to Gunther. Later on in the night, Otis is a little bit upset for losing the match. And Chad Gable, you know, very passionate, still talking about, you know, wanting to be intercontinental champion. And, you know, you, it makes you wonder if we're going to possibly see in the very near future a little split between Otis and Chad Gable. I know nobody wants to see that happen, but this has obviously got to lead to something. But they pick up the loss tonight. So we continue. We get video of Becky Lynch and Tiffany Stratton over the weekend. They show Becky Lynch's injury. And Tegan Knox is unable to have her title match tonight. So as soon as Becky Lynch is healed, and we learn later on it'll be next week, she'll get her rematch. Or she'll get her title match. So we get an impromptu match tonight. Chelsea Green shows up. 
Chelsea Green starts cracking jokes at Tegan Knox, and she says it's probably good that your your match got postponed so you could save the embarrassment of losing. So Tegan Knox is like, I got an idea. How's about we have a match tonight? So the impromptu match is announced. We're going to get Tegan Knox versus Chelsea Green a little bit later in the night. Big Bronson Reed pretty much squashes Cedric Alexander. You know, I don't like seeing anybody released, but you see how to use Cedric Alexander tonight, and you say to yourself, um, what are they going to do with this guy now that Shelton Benjamin is gone? Is he literally now the guy to go to for squash matches? I mean, Bronson Reed, they're trying to take to the next level. By Elimination Chamber in Australia, Bronson Reed will have a high-profile match. Bronson Reed is improve, improving. He's connecting more with the fans. The fans pop with the tsunami. hits the tsunami tonight on Cedric Alexander. The crowd loved it. You know, Bronson Reed still doesn't have that much of a personality, but now he's become a viable threat. And we'll see where it goes. I mean, do not discount the possibility of Gunther versus Bronson Reed. I mean, I know they're two heels and everything, but Bronson Reed, they are going to start pushing to the next level. And, you know, the crowd is accepting him. That's probably the best way to put it. You know, indifference is the worst thing to have. The crowd is no longer indifferent about Bronson Reed. They actually get into the matches a little bit. Go look back at that match today. As quickly as it was, though, crowd was into Bronson Reed a little bit. I mean, when you got somebody that big, you know, especially doing those moves, especially when we talk about Ivar in a few moments, you know, but the, the Ivar's move was kind of interesting, though, which, which we will get into. Um, next, we had the contract signing. And, you know, we expected it to be next week's Raw. We had a feeling it wasn't going to be Fastlane. They never mentioned Fastlane last week. And I personally never felt, WWE felt, that Tommaso Ciampa versus Gunther was premium live event material. It's not a knock on Ciampa. It's just, it is what it is. I never thought that it was premium live event material, even though their match at Stand and Deliver was incredible. Wasn't five star, but it was excellent. And if they came close to that, they were going to tear it up. But we ended up getting the match tonight. They have the contract signing. And Tommaso Ciampa cut a very passionate promo. The only thing I disagreed with it is when Ciampa was talking about how it seemed like things are handed to Gunther. You know, because he's talking about himself and he's always been fed or served roadkill and they're supposed to turn it into filet mignon. And, you know, sorry, Gunther doesn't feel like he's handed anything. Gunther has been busting his ass. But Ciampa talking about himself, it was good. It was very passionate. The crowd got into it. He said that his fans were going to be sitting ringside next week. And he said he's not doing it for his family. He's doing it for the five-year-old kid in him that when he was five years old, he always dreamed about becoming an intercontinental champion. And Gunther, while this is going on, Gunther is not looking at him. Gunther's making little smiles, pissed off Ciampa to the point where Ciampa is like, boy, look at me when I'm talking to you. And Ciampa looks at Gunther, and Ciampa is like, I'm looking at you right now. You show up dressed like this. Oh, yeah, I'm going one step ahead. Ciampa is dressed with a tank top and a pair of jeans. Gunther is wearing a suit. And Gunther's looking at him, and he says, the way you're dressed tells me everything I need to know. And once I'm done with you, you can hug your family and keep on dreaming because this is the closest you're ever going to get to this Intercontinental Championship. Adam Pierce is there. Ciampa signs the contract. Gunther doesn't sign it right away. And Ciampa starts saying, we don't have to wait till next Monday. We don't even have to wait till Fastlane. We could do it right here tonight in San Jose. So Gunther tells Adam Pierce that he feels that Tommaso Ciampa should prove it. So Tommaso Ciampa gets into a brawl with Gunther. 
after Gunther signs the contract. And Adam Pierce reveals that we're getting the match tonight. That replaces Jey Uso versus Damian Priest. So they're brawling in the middle of the ring, and Tommaso Ciampa ultimately puts the Sicilian stretch onto Gunther. Gunther gets out of Dodge. Ciampa holds the title up in the air in the corner, and the crowd popped big for it. I mean, I think we kind of knew what the outcome was going to be tonight, but this segment was good. It made you interested in seeing the match, even though you kind of knew where the out, what the outcome was going to be. But they really did a good job hyping it up for tonight's main event. Next, we had Kofi, uh, excuse me, Xavier Woods versus Ivar with Kofi Kingston on commentary. And Kofi throwing a little bit of seed planting about Drew McIntyre. You know, hopefully Drew, you know, straightens himself out before it's too late. You know, because that's where they're leading with this. But Ivar, once again, putting on a great match. And what was, what was great about tonight was the move that he executed after the match was over left everybody chanting, holy shit. And he was the talk of the IWC. But what was so cool about it was he lost the fucking match. And nobody was talking about the fact that he lost the match. They're all saying Ivar deserves his flowers. Give Ivar credit. Holy shit, this guy could actually work. He's moving around like a 180-pound cruiserweight. Xavier Woods and Ivar put on a really good match. Now, I'm going to go one step ahead. Ivar, after the match was over, he starts beating down on Xavier Woods. There's a reason why I'm showing you something out of place. He starts beating down on Xavier Woods, so Kofi Kingston hits the ring, and Kofi is trying to save his partner. Ivar starts beating the crap out of both. Ivar dumps, power bombs uh, Kofi onto Xavier Woods, and then Ivar climbs the top rope, and then Ivar, with both Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods on the mat, nails an awesome-looking... Uh, moonsault and the crowd is chanting holy shit holy shit and it looked great the only thing that kind of took away from it which I personally think they should have never done and it's not a shot on Xavier Woods but if you're going to showcase Ivar having that agility and also manhandling Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston Personally, I would not have done this right before that because how Xavier Woods wins is he picks up Ivar, which people were just in total amazement of because Xavier Woods is deceivingly strong. And he literally, look at the crowd getting out of their seats. And he dumps Ivar. So... Xavier Woods showing off his strength right before Ivar got to show his stuff off. But uh, it was a good match. Crowd was into it. Crowd got off their feet when they saw both of those spots. So good for good for Ivar. I mean, honestly, I'm still not a fan of the Viking Raiders. It's going to take a lot for me to, you know, get invested in them again. But you have to give credit where credit is due. Ivar right now, as a singles guy, He's doing a damn good job. I wonder how Eric feels right now with all due respect. There's got to be a little bit of, you know, lighthearted jealousy, supportive jealousy. Like he's supportive of his partner, but probably a little bit, you know, like, fuck. The more he does his singles, you know, there's always that chance that, you know, they may keep him as his singles. Ivar deserves a little credit tonight. Uh, they did mention... Jay Cargill, very early on Raw, once again, showing the press that she got. And look, you look at her and she looks like a, almost like a comic book character. And that's not a knock on Jay Cargill. You, you, if you saw her and not know anything about her background, you'd probably think that, oh, she's been in like superhero movies or this. Uh, you understand that if she could put her wrestling shit together. I mean, that's an investment. 
that is a huge investment for the future. So a lot of publicity going her way and deservingly so. But with that comes the pressure. She knows that if she stinks up the joint, you know, she's, you know, it's going to backfire. There's a lot of pressure for her to actually, you know, put it all together. I think she will. I mean, again, this is not, you know, kissing WWE's ass, but you look over the years, they've created a, hot, a hell of a lot more stars than they have not. You know, there's been a couple of, you know, misfires here and there, no question. But, you know, you see even the current women's roster. And you see how when that's why when people said a couple of years ago, oh, they're erasing Triple H's legacy with NXT. Mean you, you look at the main roster with the women, about 80% of the women on the main roster came from NXT. Like it sounds like it makes sense, but it doesn't. Almost all of them are from NXT. We'll see what WWE does with Jay Cargill. So now we have uh, Seth Rollins with Michael Cole. Seth Rollins said something tonight that I found almost impossible to believe, but I believe it to be true. Seth Rollins talking to Michael Cole. Ask Michael Cole, how many years are you doing this? I think he said 26 years. Seth Rollins says, how many shows have you missed that he was supposed to do? And he said, two. So you're telling me in the 26 years that Michael Cole has been a commentator for WWE, he's had some days off, but he only missed two appearances? That's mind-boggling. I never, ever knew that to be true. And I don't, there's no reason for me to think that it's a lie. Basically, Seth Rollins here is talking about the reason why Michael Cole is still doing this is because he's addicted to this. He loves this. I mean, he just absolutely loves wrestling and Seth Rollins trying to compare it that this is a love. It's a feeling and it feels right. And Seth Rollins talking about fast lane, you know, Michael Cole, you know, having a little bit of concern, you know, are you concerned? And Seth Rollins confident. He's talking about the love for wrestling, talking about, you know, that he's got to win this. Shinsuke Nakamura shows up on the Titan Tron. And Shinsuke talking, saying how he's sick and tired of hearing Seth Rollins. He accuses Seth Rollins of faking the back injury for sympathy. And he claims that Seth Rollins wants the world to feel sorry for him. So we think Shinsuke is not there. But Shinsuke ends up in the ring, nails Seth Rollins from the back. And I'm not going to lie. I thought this was kind of stupid. The Shinsuke stuff was great. Now picture this if you didn't see Raw. You got the Titan Tron and Shinsuke's on the Titan Tron. Shinsuke physically is in the ring laying out Seth Rollins. Hits him with Kinshasa. And the Titan Tron, Shinsuke starts counting to 10. One, two, three, four. He gets to seven. And Seth Rollins is getting up as if a referee was counting the 10. It was a little goofy, like Seth had to get up before the count of 10. And it was Shinsuke. So when Shinsuke got to seven and Seth got up, somebody in production hit the pause button. So the Titantron stops counting the 10. So Shinsuke wails Seth Rollins in the back with a bunch of chair shots actually drops Seth Rollins' spine first onto a folded chair, sitting up. And then the Titans run, they hit play again. One, two, three. He gets to, I think, nine. And Seth Rollins gets up again. And again, I know why, you know, but it was just kind of goofy because Seth Rollins is like trying to get up before the count of 10, but Shinsuke is the one doing the counting. So anyway, Shinsuke lays him out a couple of more times, hits him with the, another Kinsasha, and then Shinsuke in the ring 
He's like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It, it was great. So Shinsuke is tremendously over as a heel right now. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think Shinsuke right now is having the best character run since he's been on the main roster. There's been other feuds that I've enjoyed more. Some of the work with AJ and others in the past were, I loved it. But here, as far as the character and the personality, Shinsuke, I always felt, was one of those that people really, at the end of the day, can't dislike. You know, like, he's one of those guys that, you know, you you know, he's being a heel, but, you, you know, you find it hard to dislike him. You might find him an annoying, especially when he used to put his feet in the corner and go, ah, ah, ah. you know, it was like kind of goofy, but um, he's nailing it right now. And I'm actually looking forward to this last man standing match. It really, some people think that Shinsuke is going to be champion. I'm not revealing my predictions yet. We'll do that Tuesday, but this was a good segment. And in the end, Shinsuke Nakamura leaves Seth Rollins laying. And the crowd bought into it. Very, very good segment. I really enjoyed it. All right. Becky Lynch is in the back. She is there. Actually, oh, yeah, here's a cool screenshot. Shinsuke holding up that title. Crowd was into it, man. It wasn't pi just piped in noise. You could see the crowd was audibly and physically booing the shit out of this guy tonight. But we see Tegan Knox in the back with Becky Lynch. And Becky is very apologetic. She says as soon as she's medically cleared, Tegan Knox will get her championship opportunity. And then Natalia shows up. And Natalia has a brief stare down with Becky Lynch. And Becky walks off. And then... I mean, unless this leading, this is leading to a heel turn swerve, Natalia, one week after out of nowhere being a complete douche, let's be honest, tonight she apologizes and she says, you know, look, I realize, you know, I made a mistake last week and she's acting all inspirational to Tegan Knox. And I truly believe that when you get your opportunity, you're going to nail it. Now, I know a lot of you out there think Natalia will turn on Tegan Knox, but there's a lot of people out there, let's be honest, that just don't give a shit at this point. Like two weeks ago, Natty was a baby face. Last week, Natty was an asshole. This week, Natty is apologetic. It's all over the place. But even more, Tegan Knox has a match tonight against Chelsea Green. Piper Nevin is at ringside. Piper Nevin is distracting Tegan Knox. So Natalia comes out there and helps neutralize Piper Nevin. And as a result, Tegan Knox gets the win on Chelsea Green. Crowd is reacting to Tegan Knox. And if you remember two weeks ago, or last week, I talked about why they went with Natalia over Tegan Knox on that first title defense. And looking back on it, it was a very smart decision on WWE's part because now you had Tegan Knox interact with Becky, Natalia, and Chelsea Green in a matter of two weeks. And now her value feels like it has increased. And the crowd has got a liking to her and there's no reason why they shouldn't. So they had a little bit of an impromptu match tonight. Um... We had a segment with Adam Pierce and Drew McIntyre. And this was interesting because Drew McIntyre does, does not want to be on Miz TV again because we thought we were going to get another edition of Miz TV. Adam Pierce is with Drew McIntyre. And he says, you know, is everything all right with you? And Drew McIntyre is basically talking about, you know, why? Because I wasn't there for Kofi or for others, well, guess what? Nobody was there for Drew McIntyre when the bloodline was doing what they were doing. And Drew McIntyre has a point. So Drew McIntyre is going to come to the ring, but he doesn't want to be a part of Miz TV. So Drew hits the ring, and he mocks Cody Rhodes a little bit. Remember what we talked about last week, that Drew McIntyre versus Cody Rhodes is expected to go down in the very near future. Tonight, I think those seeds were planted a little bit. 
Because when Drew came into the ring, first thing he did was, so guys, what do you want to talk about? Like mocking Cody Rhodes. But then Drew McIntyre basically says, look, I don't answer to the locker room anymore. I answer to my fans. And he, as he walked down to the ring, he's slapping hands with fans, high fives. But remember, Bobby Lashley did that on SmackDown Friday as well before they did their full-fledged turn. Bobby Lashley, when he came down to the ring, he was shaking hands with fans as well. So Drew McIntyre says that forgiveness is weakness, and he does not want to forgive Jey Uso. He feels forgiveness is weakness. So the Miz's music hits. The Miz does not forgive Drew McIntyre for what happened last week. And then we get more of the goofy, shut up, Miz. And to make sure that the fans don't forget about that remark, Miz reminds everyone that last week Drew got 10,000 fans to chant, shut up, Miz. So what do the fans do tonight? Shut up, Miz. Shut up, Miz. So the Miz you know, is basically getting the crowd against him. And Drew tells the Miz, you got to stand up for yourself. So Miz starts getting in Drew McIntyre's face. And let's be honest, Miz tonight showed big set of balls. If you look at the whole segment as a whole, Miz gets in Drew McIntyre's face and said that he stood up for Drew. And then Miz tells Drew that he should embrace who he really is. We get another, shut up, Miz. And then Drew McIntyre says, you know, come on. Reveal who you truly are. I know. I know what some people say. Kind of sounds like Uncle Howdy, right? Revel in what you are. So Drew McIntyre says, yeah, Miz, I know what you want me to do. You want me to turn bad. You want me to hit Seth Rollins with the bad back. That's not how I operate. I operate. I rack up wins and I get title shots. And you know what? How's about we fight tonight? So Miz talks about how Drew McIntyre is two-faced. Miz declines the match. He's wearing a suit. Drew's wearing a skirt. But he says, right now in the ring, we got good Drew. Drew McIntyre is good when he wants to be good. But when someone gets beat down, then we get bad Drew. So he's two-faced Drew. So Drew says to him again, shut up. And the Miz says, I don't want to sh shut up. I want to throw up. And now at this point, I'm like, okay, he's got like kind of a big set of balls tonight. So the Miz says, you know what? I think he said like his grandma told him, you know, he's going to be the hero and he will walk away. So he backs off, and with Drew McIntyre with his back turned, Miz attacks him with the microphone. Miz is laying the boots on Drew McIntyre. We go to a commercial break. We come back, and we get a match between Miz and Drew McIntyre. And Drew McIntyre, getting the upper hand towards the end, teases the Claymore, but stops. Now, the fans are confused. Okay, are we going to get a turning point with Drew right now? Like, where is this going to lead? So Drew doesn't do the Claymore. Instead, he sees the sword, and he picks up the sword, and the referee immediately threatens to disqualify him. Can't bring the sword in the ring. So Drew gives the sword to the referee. So as the referee turns his back and takes the sword outside the ring, reaches over, Drew McIntyre removes the top turnbuckle, smashes Miz's head in the top turnbuckle. Then he hits the Future Shock DDT for the win. And if you listen closely, Wade Barrett even said that Drew McIntyre decided to go cheap tonight. So you got to pay close attention to Drew McIntyre, uh, his actions and Wade Barrett's commentary because Wade is trying to plant seeds also that Drew McIntyre is starting to go the cheap route. You know, Drew doesn't care anymore. Drew's going to do what Drew wants to do. Okay. As I said earlier, Trick Williams shows up. Nice little reaction. This leads to tomorrow night with Dominic Mysterio in that rematch. Then we got a segment 
that it felt like it was nothing but filler. Cody Rhodes comes out there. And all Cody Rhodes says is, oh, so the Judgment Day will be at SmackDown Friday, right? Well, guess what? So will I. And Jay will be there as well. And they talk about how at Fastlane that they're going to bring the championships back to Raw. The segment was probably a minute at the most. It just felt like they needed to kill a couple of minutes time. That's what it felt like to me. So we go to commercial, we come back, and as we talked about at the beginning of the show tonight, Gunther retains the Intercontinental Championship, beating, so there's, there's your Cody Rhodes promo talking about winning at Fastlane, but Gunther retains the Intercontinental Championship against Tommaso Ciampa. This was an excellent match. Not on the level of stand and deliver. We had at least one commercial break. I think we may have even had two. Um, kind of killed the monot the you know the momentum a little bit. But towards the end of the match, listen, I know some people when they know they're on camera, they're extra dramatic. I'm gonna take my glasses off for this one. If you go back and you watch the main event, especially the last five minutes, you will remember this. In fact, you may even remember it now when I bring it up. When Tommaso Ciampa, towards the end of the match, got a two count on Gunther, they showed in slow motion some of the crowd reaction at ringside. And I saw this woman that had to be in her maybe mid-30s to early 40s, and she's with her husband and somebody else, and they show in slow motion them going like this, like, they honestly thought Ciampa was going to get the win. You had to say, I mean, talk about acting. Like, if you watch it, you know what I'm talking about. Like, there's some people like, look, is it two count? You'd be like, you know, like, you're the, these people are like, really over the top. That's why they were on camera. That's why they were on camera. But Ciampa put on a good fight. And Ciampa did have Gunther in a Sicilian stretch, but Gunther ultimately hit two power bombs on Tommaso Ciampa, and then he locked in, put him to sleep, and Ciampa is out. Gunther retains. And again, we're two minutes from 11, and Gunther quickly leaves that ring. And here comes Vinci. And here comes Kaiser. And they're beating down Ciampa. Now, remember, two weeks ago, we had Alpha Academy team up with Ciampa to take on all three members of Imperium. So most people tonight thought that Alpha Academy was going to make the save for Ciampa. But instead, we get Johnny Gargano's music. Johnny Gargano comes out there. Crowd is popping big. Johnny Gargano, you know, takes care of business. Ciampa gets the upper hand and... You know, we didn't get enough time to see them really emotionally react to the fact that DIY is back together. I mean, Michael Cole at the very end, you hear him go, DIY, as if anybody, casual fans on the main roster even know what that is. I mean, you and I know what it is, but a lot of people have no idea what that means. But um, they are back together. And, you know, as we talked about over the weekend, this was never going to be a long feud between Gunther and Ciampa. They had a match in NXT that was really top level. They needed an opponent for Gunther. At the present time, Gunther is feuding with nobody right now, and you cannot use Chad Gable as the, the feud. Inspirational feud, but at right now, it is not that time. So they needed to put somebody in there, and you look at that Raw roster, there's not many people you could throw in there right now. You know, ultimately, people want to see Cody Rhodes and Gunther go at it, but a lot of people feel that that's a match that not, should not happen until next year. Don't know. We already had Gunther go through several people on Raw. There's not that many individuals. If you really look at it, there's not many people that Gunther can feud with right now. So Ciampa was someone who they were able to eat up three or four weeks between the six-man tag to, you know, him taking on Vinci and then taking on Kaiser 
And then, you know, the, the last week leads to a contract signing this week. And we thought the match was going to happen next week. But they decided, you know what? Let's do it tonight. Let's get it over with. Let's scrap Jey Uso versus Damian Priest. And instead, we'll have that as the main event. Bring back DIY. And then next week, you'll see Imperium, Kaiser and Vinci taking on DIY. They'll kind of tease that Ciampa could still be in the hunt for the IC title, but that's what they got to do with several people. So that's how we went off the air. You know, much different closing. If you really think about it, much different closing. Did you, did you ever think in this current state of WWE Raw that we would have had Gargano and Ciampa close out Raw? I don't think a lot of people would have said, you know what? As the go home show to Fast Lane, as the go home Raw show to Fast Lane, we'll have Ciampa and Gargano close it out. Kind of a little strange, right? So instead, they're going to load up SmackDown with a lot of the go home momentum because Fast Lane is the following day. I apologize about my hat. For some reason, my hat feels like it got like super small. It feels like I'm wearing. No, we're not going to say it. So that was your episode of Raw tonight. Decent show. Oh, you know, I had to show you something else. Because I know some of someone out there is going to want to know this. You know, obviously with Edge gone from WWE, they have to take him off of the intro of the then, now, forever, together. You know, then, now, together, forever. Well, uh, I got a couple of screenshots for you. That's how it looked before. You had Edge on the right, Finn Balor on the left, where it said, then, now, together, forever. Well, let, hopefully you could keep up with me when I show you this. Edge has been replaced by Seth Rollins. But remember, Seth Rollins originally was next to Becky Lynch. So if Seth Rollins is now in the place of Edge and Seth Rollins is no longer with Becky Lynch on the intro, well, well, Seth Rollins has been replaced by Sheamus. So did you, did you follow me? Did you get all that? So Edge is replaced by Seth Rollins, who is replaced by Sheamus. There you go. I try to keep up with everything. All right. Very quickly. Uh, Let's do ratings quick, and then we'll finish with a little plug for this week in history. Because I got a couple of sound clips. You'll either absolutely love them, or you. we got a cr two cringe moments. For me, next to Triple H having sex with a mannequin and throwing chop meat into the camera with Katie Vick, this has got to be cringe moment number two for me in the history of Monday Night Raw. I don't know if anybody out there can figure out what that number two cringe moment is, but it happened this week in history. First, let's talk a little bit of ratings, shall we? And then we can stop bringing this home. Raw last week, little rebound, 1,465,000. That is up from the week prior is 1,331,000. The high point from last, remember early I said the high point and the low point involved the same people twice? The high point of Raw last week was the Cody Rhodes Judgment Day opening segment. That did 1,644,000. Decent number. 1,644,000. Judgment Day Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso, opening up Raw. The lowest point of Raw last week was the Judgment Day. Finn Balor and Damian Priest versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. That only did 1,248,000. I will guarantee you in the next couple of weeks, AEW will have at least one quarter that will be higher than this. It's not the end of the world, and it's not the most amazing orgasmic thing in the world, but you know that there's going to be people out there that are going to blow that shit up. So just remember that, that number. By the way, after the opening segment with Cody Rhodes, Sami Zayn, and the Judgment Day, uh, excuse me, Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso, and the Judgment Day last week, the uh, segment, by the end of the segment, the rating went down 115,000 viewers. 
So even at the beginning of Raw last week, 100,000 fans during that opening segment said, you know, I'm going to change the channel. It's a big deal. NXT last week, way down, way down. 636,000 viewers, down from the week prior is 824. The high point from last week was the backstage segment where Trick Williams was added to the three-way match, making it a fatal four-way to determine Dominic Mysterio's opponent at NXT No Mercy. And also the restaurant segment with the family in Los Lotarios. That did 672,000. Remember that 672 number because I'm going to get into a little tidbit. It's actually a positive about NXT this week. The low point from NXT Tuesday was Joe Coffey and Butch, the opening of that match. Now, by the time that match was over, it did 610. So it did a decent number, but it opened up with 587. Now, what is cool about NXT this week was that there was no big peaks or valleys. The biggest increase for the entire night from quarter to quarter was only 43,000 viewers. And the lowest decrease from quarter to quarter, you know how sometimes we say that some of these shows drop 100, 200,000 viewers in a matter of 15 minutes? The biggest decrease during the entire two hours of NXT was only 23,000 viewers. So they maintained pretty much their viewership the entire night. That's, that's the positive you could take out of NXT last week, even though it did go down 20%. AEW Dynamite Wednesday did 855,000 viewers. That is down from the week prior is 984. MJF continues to dominate in the ratings. His confrontation with Jay White did 944,000 viewers. The low point of Dynamite was Julie Hart versus Willow Nightingale and the cotton, uh, the contract signing between Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland. That did 755,000 viewers. And by the way, talk about viewership drops. Orange Cassidy versus Austin Gunn versus Matt Jackson versus Penta. From the beginning of the match to the end of the match, they lost 111,000 viewers. 111,000 people during that match decided they were going to change the channel. Big deal. New Japan Pro Wrestling this week did 60, uh, this past Thursday did 62,000 viewers. That is slightly up from the week prior is 53,000. I hate to say this, but we got to say it. When it comes to Impact Wrestling, a good portion of their fans are not interested in nostalgia. They're not interested in seeing men and women from 15 years ago because Impact 1000 episode celebration, the two-week event, their ratings went down. This past Thursday, they were back to normal with their programming. Their rating did 127,000 viewers up from the week prior's 104. They went up about 22%. So fans came back after two weeks of the ratings going down. Plus, I don't talk about demos unless it's newsworthy. Their demo was three times the number this past Thursday than it was the last two weeks for Impact 1000. They tripled their 18 to 49 demo the week after the nostalgia ended. That's newsworthy, in my opinion. Rampage. This past Friday, this is surprising. 364,000 viewers, that is up from the week prior, is 341. And remember, the week before was Grand Slam Rampage, the two-hour event with some very high-profile matches. Last week, beat Grand Slam Rampage. Go figure. The high point from Friday's Rampage was the acclaimed and Billy Gunn versus the Hardys and Isaiah Cassidy. That did 418,000 viewers. The low point... Got to call it like we see it. Women's wrestling on AEW Dynamite. Fans are not stupid. Fans could feel that AEW does not put a big investment as far as the women on TV. They give matches, but it doesn't feel, once again, the lowest part of their show. Both shows this week, lowest. Actually, 
If you look at, uh, yeah, Dynamite and Rampage, the low point this week was Akara Shida versus Ruby Soho to determine Soraya's opponent, uh, I believe, next week on Dynamite. That only did 338,000 viewers. SmackDown this past Friday increased a little bit. 2,303,000 viewers. That is up from the week prior is 2,227. Get a load of this. The high point. Actually, let's do the opposite. The low point of SmackDown this past Friday was the first half of Rey Mysterio versus Santos Escobar. That did 2,168,000 viewers. The high point from SmackDown. The second half of Rey Mysterio versus Santos Escobar, that did 2,382,000 viewers. They actually increased 220,000 viewers as the match went on. So Rey versus Santos has the lowest quarter and the highest quarter because they were back-to-back. And for those that are curious, I always try to think a little ahead, for those wondering, what did John Cena and LA Knight do to close out SmackDown? They actually were very close to Santos versus Rey Mysterio. Santos versus Rey Mysterio did 2,382,000. John Cena and LA Knight did 2,338,000. So they were second highest for the night. And then the September 23rd AEW collision, that did 562,000 viewers. The high point of that night was Andrade versus Jay White, which did 619,000 viewers. And the low point was RVD and Hook taking on Matt Menard and Angelo Parker and the promos by the Kingdom and the Dark Order that did 519. So it was about 100,000 viewership this, uh, difference between a high point and a low point. Uh, for those that want to know, tonight on main event, we had Indy Hartwell defeat Zia Lee and Nikki Cross over Caden Carter. And to close out tonight's show, uh, we're going to plug a little bit of this week in wrestling history. Pretty cool moments this week. Looking just based on these pictures, it is the anniversary of Ric Flair involved in that terrible plane crash. Shawn Michaels made his pro wrestling debut. Chris Jericho, and I'm pretty sure my research is correct, Chris Jericho and Lance Storm not only made their pro wrestling debut this week in history, but if I'm correct, their first ever match in wrestling was against each other. So uh, my, my research says to me that the Thrill Seekers, they were not called the Thrill Seekers at that time. But look at Shawn Michaels, man. Shawn Michaels, you would never, ever imagine that he would become the heartbreak kid. Uh, you know, very, very sad. But this week in history was the passing of Brian Pillman. This week in history is the anniversary, unfortunately, where Draz had that terrible injury that left him paralyzed. Uncle Elmer, another horrible moment in wrestling history. He got married on WWE television. I hated that segment. Thank God for Roddy Piper's stopping that shit. But also, this week in history, Jim Cornette on Monday Night Raw did the first of these legendary promos. Who remembers this? This is Jim Cornette, and the views that I'm about to express are not necessarily those of anybody else but me, but they ought to be, and as a matter of fact, they probably are. You know, a lot of things in the wrestling world make me cranky these days, especially the way that some talent is treated and some talent is looked at by not only the promoters, but the wrestling fans as well. For example, a man like Arn Anderson, who just had to retire from this sport after giving it his entire life because of an injury that he suffered. A guy like Nature Boy Ric Flair, who in my opinion is one of the greatest talents in the history of this business. Guys like Mankind, Cactus Jack, Dude Love, whatever you want to call him, great talents in the WWF or WCW. But who gets a lot of the attention from the wrestling fans especially? Guys like the NWO, the New World Order. You know, all the fans think these guys are so cool and so sweet and so funny. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the NWO is like a bunch of guys meeting out in the backyard in a clubhouse in a tree. They're guys who all they have to, they got the easiest job in the world. All they have to do is go out there and be themselves. Childish, obnoxious, adolescent guys with a case of severe arrested emotional development and a fixation on trying to act macho. You got a guy like Kevin Nash, 
40 years old trying to act like a teenager. As far as I'm concerned, the biggest no talent in the business, he's got six moves, no mobility, and enough timing to come up, cover up for some of it. But what he does is he goes around and he manipulates. Kevin Nash had a multi-million dollar promotional company, the WWF, push him to the moon to make him a star, and then what does he do? He leaves after he gives his word to stay in, so by the way, he's a liar too. He leaves and he goes to WCW for a big contract. Why? More on that later. You got a guy like Scott Hall, who's a good wrestler, but good's about it. He's the best of the bunch. But he had the same million dollar promotional company make him a star after he'd been in this business 10 years without putting three asses in a seat. And what does he do? He goes to WCW for a big contract. Why? More on that later. And then you got a guy, what, six, one, two, three kid. His name's Sean Mal Waltman, whatever you want to call him. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the only reason that he's employed is because the other guys think that he's funny when he gets drunk and throws up on himself. He has the distinction, in case you haven't noticed, of being the only guy since this wrestling war got started that was released from a valid contract from one company to go to the other side, which shows you how valuable he is. You know why they're all employed, why they're all in the spot they are today? Because of Eric Bischoff, the boss of WCW, not the NWO. Look at the credits on their pay-per-view if you can get one for free. The idiot's name is on it. He's the boss of WCW. He works for Ted Turner, and he throws a billionaire's money around just like water so that he can have guys that he likes to hang out with. Because even more than being a mark, yeah, for his own face and his own voice, Eric Bischoff is a guy who's a big fan of hanging around studly guys with long hair and beards that smoke cigars and ride Harleys so that some of that can rub off on his little pansy-ass frame. So he takes that billionaire's money and he throws it around like water to buy guys that he can hang around with to prove that his Johnson is bigger than everybody else's. And that's the sole reason that the NWO guys are employed. I think, me personally, that it's about time that the wrestling fans and the promoters, all of them in this business, started recognizing guys like Nature Boy Ric Flair, like Arn Anderson, like Cactus Jack, guys who bust their ass, who work hard and have ability and have talent to get where they are instead of a bunch of guys that get to their spot by hanging around with the boss and sucking up. I'm Jim Cornette, and that's my opinion. That was Monday Night Raw, 1997. 1997 was a crazy year in, in wrestling. When you really look back on it, um, even when I look at some of the things that went on, uh, this same week, I know it's really not much. It's only about 45 seconds long, but there was an infamous promo. If you remember, Steve Austin was feuding with Farouk at that time. You know, we always think about Dusty Rhodes, you know, when he talked about the struggle and he, you know, that infamous, you know, I die with kings and queens and uh, eight pumpkin beans, you know, like listen to Farouk with his kind of black version of Dusty Rhodes. Anybody remember this? Oh, fuck, let me tell you what the bottom line is, and I'm going to kick your hook ass. Wait, 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 wait. I got to rewind that. Hold on, here we go. Bottom line is, and I, oh, fuck, let me tell you what the bottom line is. And I'm going to kick your hook ass. You think you, that's because you parade around with a bald head and tattoos on each arm that makes you tough? Well, let me tell you what makes you tough. Tough is waking up on a winter's morning, having to fight your brothers for one jacket to see who wears it to school. Tough is having to eat collard greens with your hand because you don't have a fork to go around. Let me tell you what tough really is. Getting up on a bright Christmas morning, watching your younger siblings cry because they don't have brand new bicycles to ride around on like everyone else. Yo, you parade around here and use the word ass and think you're a big man. That makes you tough. No, let me tell you where I'm from. And when we use the word ass, what the context is. You been stuck your business in your nose and nation business. And let me tell you something, Puck. The way we use the word ass is that your ass belongs to me and the nation. That's so right. get it ready, right. sit on it, look at it all you can right now. Because the bottom line is, it belongs to Farouk. That was, that was very, very interesting. Um, unfortunately, the, mo the second most cringe moment in the history of Monday Night Raw happened this week in history. Very, very uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers. I mean, obviously, we all remember when Brian Pillman passed away. A lot of people probably to this day have never watched the Raw that took place right after Brian Pillman passed away. Vince McMahon had Brian Pillman's wife, Melanie Pillman, 
the same Melanie who passed away recently. Remember the storyline in AEW with Brian Pillman Jr.? Um, I can't play the video, but when you hear the audio, Vince McMahon, talk about the biggest douchebag. Not Brian Pillman wasn't even buried yet. Listen to Vince McMahon talking to his wife about Brian's passing. Joining us now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in suburban Cincinnati, uh, the wife of Brian Pillman, Melanie Pillman. Melanie, thank you so much. I'm sure you're distraught, shocked, dismayed over this this news, and we thank you very much for for joining us tonight. I wonder, uh, there's a great deal of speculation, obviously, uh, when a 35-year-old man who is in competitive condition passes away. Can you please tell us to and whatever speculation there may be. Can you, what can you tell us about what you have been told uh, as far as Brian's death is concerned? Not too um, bad so far. Well, um, apparently there was a uh, problem with his heart and uh, apparently his heart was put under a lot of stress for some reason and um, I can't really uh, you know, tell you for sure what that reason was, but it was apparent heart attack in his sleep and uh, um, till the tests all are back, uh, it, it's kind of inconclusive right now. But um, um, apparently, um, his his heart was under a lot of stress. It was there was um, some speculation last night when we spoke? Uh -huh. uh, Brian, because of his injuries, has had to take a great deal of prescribed medicine. There was some speculation that that he may have taken too much, if in fact that is proven to be the case, which it is yet to be, douche. is there anything that you would want to say to what a douchebag aspiring athletes who do get hurt and have to resort to prescribed medication, painkillers? Well, Vince, I, you know, I can't comment on whether that, you know, I know that my husband, well, not only was he an athlete, but he was involved in a car accident too, and he had extensive injuries from that. And, yes. Um, and, uh, and then after the accident, it was a lot harder for him. But um, I think all athletes, to a degree, um, experience the, a reliance on pain medicine. And, um, you know, I knew it was just a matter of time before um, it happened to someone. And um, fortunately, it it was my husband. And um, I just want everyone to know that um, I hope it's a wake-up call to some, some of you because um, it could be your husband next or it could be you and you know you don't want to leave behind a bunch of orphans and like Me my husband did <laughs> Melanie how uh, how are the children taking um, this news and and do they understand well um, a four-year-old doesn't understand it that's little Brian um, he, he doesn't understand why daddy's not coming home but um Brittany understands because uh, she's my adopted child and she's she's the um, biological child of my husband and another woman and that woman killed herself two years ago. So Brittany's uh, lost her mom and, and her dad biological and uh, you know she just screamed for about 15 minutes and um, I, I don't know Vince, it's hard. Have you this had? It's really hard. But I'm you, doing. Have you had any opportunity to think about what you now as a single parent will do to support your what five a children. Dick. Oh my God. Since I don't even uh, really know what day it is, you know, so uh, I don't um, know what I'm gonna do. Um, but I know that the outpouring of support that I've gotten from the fans and from the company um, is helping me go on. I mean, just everyone's calling and everyone's, the fans and on the internet and um, people are just supporting me all around and, and uh, but um, as far as what I'll do after this is over, I don't know. I don't even know, Vince. I don't know. Is, um, how, how would you like for Brian to be remembered by WWF fans and fans all over the world? Vince, I would like Brian to be remembered as just one of the most compassionate and loving men ever and uh, the greatest father in the world the best father in the world 
And um, he also loved his business, Vince. And um, I guess you could say he lived for this business and he died for this business. And I hope no one else has to die. Melanie, we thank you very much for joining us tonight. And yeah, thanks. on behalf of the WWF and his family. Wow. I'm not, I'm not bullshitting when I say this. I have not watched that in its entirety, really, in years and years and years. To me, it's the second worst, most cringe moment, most uncomfortable moment that I've had watching Raw since 1993. And, I mean, I just, I, you hear me defend Vince a lot over the years. I would have punched him right in the fucking mouth. If, I, if that was him talking about my dad and I was old enough, I'd punch him right in the fucking mouth. I mean, look, I don't need to tell you. I, I always pay tribute to Brian Pillman. He's one of my favorites growing up as a fan. Um, that is just awful. Now, let's move on because I got something else I want to show you. And I got another clip that I think you'll, you'll find interesting. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, this Week in History... One of the most legendary Cactus Jack promos in ECW went down. You have to tune in to hear what that's all about of Booker T receiving a gift, and it's a picture of Scott Hall. This is the anniversary where Vince McMahon was in the hospital. Not only did Steve Austin beat the crap out of him with a bedpan, but a lot of people seem, seem to forget that Mick Foley had showed up at the hospital that same day and debuted Mr. Sacco. Both happened in the same segment. This week in history also is the anniversary of Batista having his first ever MMA fight. John Cena joined the Nexus. Steve Austin stunned Linda McMahon. Uh, Tommy Dream, I believe it's the anniversary of the beginning of the House of Hardcore. That was his promotion. And then this is the anniversary of Matt Hardy relinquishing the TNA Heavyweight Championship. And the infamous match NXT TakeOver, Bailey versus Sasha Banks. It was that NXT TakeOver Respect, I believe. All this week in history. But it's one other one that I wanted to share. Oh, yeah, you got the big show. Obviously, you got the big show. I'm not going to play the whole audio clip. Just listen to the first 10 seconds. You'll understand why I'll turn it off. All right, that's enough. Uh, we don't want to play that tonight. Um, but I definitely want to play something that's pretty wild to go back and and listen to because I guarantee you about 98% of you out there probably never saw this segment on ECW television. This was, I think, 1998. And this was something that didn't air, as far as I am aware, in all the markets. And Paul Heyman, Paulie Dangerously, interviewed Tammy Sitch. And I don't know what the purpose of this interview was, but she returned to ECW after her stint as Sonny in the WWF. And I want you to listen to just some of the comments that she said, because it's kind of wild to think that this aired on ECW television. I think it might've even been 1999, 19, not 1998. Just listen to a little of this and you'll see how bizarre this is. In 1994, legendary professional wrestling manager, Jim Cornette introduced the world to Tammy Lynn Sitch in the now defunct Smoky Mountain Wrestling promotion in Knoxville, Tennessee. We felt like we were really cool. We felt on top of the world at that moment. The very next year, Tammy received her big break. She was summoned to the World Wrestling Federation, where she adopted the persona of Sonny and was overwhelmed by the bizarre world of fame and adulation. There's a site on the internet Tammy's feet. It's all pictures of like where you can see my bare feet, dedicated to my feet and my toes. So what do you think? 
Is this worth an internet site? Trust me, there are better parts of me to look at. Although, I do like my feet pretty much. But for Tammy, the price of fame was way too high. Because the pressure of being wrestling's hottest sex symbol was too much for her to handle. Well, there are many different reactions in my life to the pressure that was put on me. I would have to say prescription drug abuse. And most problems would be a muscle relaxer named Soma. I would say it's pretty widespread amongst um, a lot of athletes in the in the business. I really do because uh, uh, there are there are sometimes you can go into anybody's locker room and people are could be there passing them out if you want them. How dangerous is Soma? Uh, very. Um, good friend of ours died from mixing that with alcohol. Tell me about it. Well, his name is Luis Bacoy, and uh, he had a fun night out in LA one night with his friends, drinking and taking this pill. Went back to his house, fell asleep, never woke up. Well, he did wake up once, it was six o'clock in the morning, turned off his answering machine, and then he choked it to death uh, because he couldn't get up out of bed. Because uh, if you take enough of those things, you can be pretty much almost just like uh, paralyzed. And uh, that was pretty rough. And we lost him. I was, I was considered old by any, you know, 1997, and I was only 24 years old. And I was called the click chick because I. They were friendly to me, I was friendly to them. I would make their like hotel reservations. But I prefer to be pushed on my own talent instead of who I am friends with, who I am dating, who I am sleeping with, who I eat dinner with. I would, be for, I would prefer to be myself and be pushed as what I do and how I can do it. When I first left the World Wrestling Federation, it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. Uh, I could relax, I could have a home, I could, you know, do everything I want to do, but I didn't, I, I didn't see myself taking advantage of that yet. I saw myself just digging a hole deeper for myself. I took too much advantage of uh, being able to sit home and not do anything. And, you know, I felt too relaxed in my environment. Um, too relaxed to the point where I finally did take my first drink. My first drink was at home when there were no more pills to make you go to sleep. There have been times when my, when my, when my dad died, I would want to go with him. When my niece died, I wanted to be there with her too. Stacy, she died and she was I think 16. that's enough. I was in the hospital. Yeah, that's enough. Bizarre, right? This week in history, has got like the whole gamut. You got the big show doing a whole bunch of diarrhea, and then you got Vince McMahon being the biggest asshole, and then you got Tammy Sitch, what, almost 25 years later, basically ruining the rest of her life because of the very same thing drugs and alcohol pretty pretty freaking wild man pretty wild but uh there's a whole lot more that that goes on so you definitely want to check out this week in wrestling history there's a lot of shit just look at the synopsis tomorrow and there's some uh pretty interesting stuff that goes down but um yeah this this week was a really weird week in history but i will tell you that time frame between 1997 and 1999, pretty wild. I mean, and that's the Attitude Era, and that's the Monday Night Wars, and that's when everything was really at its zenith as far as, you know, all this crazy shit going down. But, uh, hey, I don't dictate what happens, you know, in the weeks in history. All I could do is share with you. But... I try to share moments that are fun, that are sad, that are a little controversial, things that you may have never even knew ever existed. And uh, yeah, that's kind of an example of one because you realize that in 
1999, she was experiencing the very same things that would basically ruin the rest of her life and what went down last year. Pretty, pretty crazy, pretty crazy. But, um, all right. We ended up going a little about two hours. So, uh, you know, very busy weekend. If you really think about it tomorrow, NXT, we got the breakout tournament starting. Becky Lynch will be there. Dominic Mysterio will defend the, uh, excuse me. Trick Williams will defend the NXT North American championship against Dominic Mysterio. I'm really curious to see what goes down, especially if Dominic loses. What's going to cause the loss? Will Rhea Ripley be there? Will J.D. McDonough be there? We will have to wait and see. And then this Wednesday. Now, I will tell you this much. As far as AEW this Wednesday, I mean, they are banking on a lot of people tuning in simply because Adam Copeland will be on because they are advertising Adam Copeland. He is going to be there, I believe, live and in person and cutting a promo. As of tonight, the only two matches that were announced was Ray Phoenix defending the international championship against Nick Jackson. And some people even think that that match may not go down. Uh, some with Ray Phoenix not being able to compete at Wrestle Dream. So Ray Phoenix, I don't even know if, if that match is going to go on. But also Wednesday, you got Sammy Guevara and Kenosuke Takeshka against Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega. So they are continuing that. So uh, it's going to be an interesting week. I am really curious what this rating is going to look like with Adam Copeland. Um, CM Punk returning to wrestling couple of years ago and showing up on AEW TV was just a really fun memory and it popped a really good rating. You would think Adam Copeland should be able to top that. Do you? I mean, does anybody think that AEW minimum should do 1.1 million? You get at least 200,000 extra fans to tune in to see you know, what he has to say. Not everybody ordered the pay-per-view yesterday. You know, when you really think about it, you know, it's a very small percentage of fans that ordered a pay-per-view. A lot of people will get it bootlegged, and the UK will get it for free this Thursday. But, um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a hell of a lot of people that are going to be curious to see what he does in AEW. And his first match, his first match is going to be next Thursday, and he's taking on Luchasaurus. So a lot of people think we're going to see a little bit more interaction between Adam Copeland and Christian Cage. So uh, listen, it, it's it's fun moment. It's not going to be, you know, the be all end all. You know, I don't think many people are going to suddenly become AEW fans simply because Adam Copeland is there. You know, at the end of the day, he is going to be 50 years old. And, you know, his career his biggest moments are beyond past him, but he could still go. And there's enough matches there. We, j I just hope that there's strong storylines attached to them because some matches are intriguing, but I'd like a nice, strong storyline to go with it. I don't want matches going down simply for them to go down. You know, for me, storylines are an important part of it, so... Yeah, somebody brought up the Major League Baseball playoffs. I don't think that's really going to be that much of a factor because with a team, it's regionalized. So, like, for example, if Philadelphia is playing, I think Philadelphia fans are going to be the ones most inclined to watch it. Baseball fans will tune in, but I don't know if it's going to be must-see. I'll watch AEW on a replay type deal. And if I'm AEW, I do not wait until the end of the night to put Adam Copeland on TV. I would have him open up the show uh, or at minimum, you know, have him open up hour two. I don't think you save it for the very end unless there's something big to go along with it. So, all right, I'm going to jet out of here. Hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. If you check out NXT tomorrow, enjoy that as well. If you are part of our Patreon family or if you become one, you're welcome to join us live tomorrow night. Kevin and I will be doing your Fastlane preview and predictions. 
That'll start around 10.05 p.m. Eastern. And then as far as the predictions contest for our channel members here and our patrons, that will be online by Thursday. And you'll have about 48 hours to get your predictions in. So you'll have plenty of time to do it. Just don't wait until the last minute. Some people out there think that there's going to be a spoiler somewhere at the last minute. So if they wait, they have a better chance of getting this stuff right. If a spoiler comes out, the match becomes void. So, you know, get your predictions in, you know, as soon as you can. Because I hate it when people, you know, miss it. You know, you'll have it two days. They could put it up. Two days goes by and then you end it. You're like, all right, contest is closed. Good luck, everybody. And then you usually get a handful of people. Oh, man, I forgot to put my prediction in. Oh, I was going to put it. You know, you snooze, you lose. So 48 hours should be more than enough time. It only takes about 60 seconds to put a prediction in. So everyone be well. Have a good night. Sorry about the, the cringe history stuff, but hey, it's history and you got to take the good and you got to take the bad sometimes. So, you know, uh, at least, you know, we got better times, you know, and it, you know, it it is what it is. But, uh, man, I would have punched Vince right in the goddamn mouth that time. I, you know, it, and I was doing my wrestling hotline at that time. I do not remember what I said on my hotline at that time. I did not have wrestling-news.com until 1999, I believe. So I don't even think I had a website yet where I could go back and look at what the reaction was. But I'm sure the IWC was ripping the shit out of him. Um, I got to go to Wayback Machine. I got to look at the wrestling news sites from 1997 to see how people were reacting. I would think in droves, people were killing him for that. That was just awful. But uh, all right, everybody, be well. Much love. If you enjoyed the show, you know, hit that thumbs up. You know, subscribe if you haven't done so already. You know, I, I know every show, every channel, every podcast that tell you the same thing, but. You know, there is a legit thing called an algorithm here. And, uh, you know, there's so much of my numbers out there that get skewed because I got video here and free stuff here and audio here. And, you know, it's uh, because it's so, you know, spread out, you know, my numbers are all over the place. But, uh, you know, you do little things like that and it's free. It helps my show because, you know, if I'm just pissing in the wind over here, you know, then everything goes back to audio only and that stays the way it is. But, uh, you know, do that stuff. It helps, you know, spread the word. And uh, I'm going to go get my ass a little bit of sleep. So you all be well, everybody. Take care. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody-good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just tuck it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the hosts. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.